Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vertical Space, a podcast at the intersection of technology and flight. We are your hosts, Jim Barry and Luka Tomjanovic, and here we look at the most important forces shaping the market of advanced air mobility, with a particular focus on why and how they matter to those building a business in this very exciting and growing industry. I think we need to enhance the ability for industry to do research and development in the United States in order to maintain our global leadership. I think that's a critical national security issue. We shouldn't need to rely on the ability to fly internationally or partner with DOD in order to get flight time in the U.S. I think it's a great way to get flight time. I think it's a great way to get experience. But I think that the FAA considers the national airspace in the U.S. to be particularly complex. And so it's not like you're going to be able to say, well, I'm flying in so-and-so country, so therefore you have to approve me here and they're gonna rubber stamp that. That's not how it works. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Vertical Space. When it comes to drone policy, overall drone and advanced air mobility value and understanding, Lisa Elman is in rarefied air. So this is an important and entertaining conversation with one of the world's top drone professionals. Lisa is the executive director of the Commercial Drone Alliance and partner at Hogan Lovells. Listen to how she describes the great use cases and value that is being realized today and what outcomes we hope to achieve with drones and advanced drone mobility in general. Listen to Lisa's description of and takeaways from the August 22 White House Summit, where the highest levels of leadership are focused on advanced air mobility and how the summit was an amazing first step. And listen to what Lisa hopes is the ideal next step from the summit. Lisa warns that technology is moving faster than policy today and that there's a lot of work to be done to align the two. She talks about key remaining regulatory hurdles that need to be cleared before drones can broadly scale across the economy. She also discusses why other countries are scaling drones faster than the United States and discusses the importance of policymakers and innovators working hand in hand to make advances and why rulemaking is needed to help the industry scale. You may be surprised by Lisa's answer to Lucas' question on when she expects the first type certified drones in the United States. Lisa also discusses the importance of and status of beyond visual line of sight scaled drone operations across the U.S. and her view of the timeline for beyond visual line of sight aviation rulemaking committee recommendations and how the FAA might implement them and ultimately turn them into rulemaking. We also discuss drone associated elements certification, why it came up and how it will be solved as well as airspace ownership rights, how it's still a hot topic and under what circumstances it could impact drone operations at scale. I really liked her discussion of the overall advanced air mobility ecosystem, drones, EV tall, regional air mobility, how they're similar and how they can learn from each other as they advance and the importance of collaboration within the industry. Listen to how she describes her work at the White House 10 years ago, how they envisioned the future of drones and what is advanced according to that plan and what still needs to be done. Finally, you'll enjoy Lisa's advice to entrepreneurs including the importance of building a relationship with the FAA and specific areas where she believes innovators could focus. Heck, what other advanced air mobility podcasts do you get to hear references to Modern Family and Paw Patrol? Well, you'll hear it today. Lisa is one of our great industry leaders. Thanks for joining us, Lisa. And to our guests, we're sure you'll enjoy our discussion as you innovate in the vertical space. This episode of the Vertical Space Podcast is brought to you by UAvionics. UAvionics is the leader in low size, weight and power certified avionics for manned, unmanned and advanced air mobility aircraft. Let UAvionics help you achieve your goals, whether that be type certification, airspace access or beyond visual line of sight operations. UAvionics has certified and certifiable communications, navigation and surveillance avionics for your aircraft. So head over to uavionics.com or Google it to see how you can start flying safer and move your platform forward into shared airspace. Lisa Elman serves as the executive director of the Commercial Drone Alliance, an independent nonprofit organization led by key figures of the commercial drone industry. She also chairs the Global Uncrewed Aircraft Systems, UAS Group, at the global law firm Hogan Lovells, where she's a leading public policy lawyer focusing on domestic drones, advanced air mobility, and other emerging technologies. Lisa is widely recognized as one of the world's foremost authorities on drones and law. Lisa's focus is safely expanding the commercial drone and advanced air mobility industries. She also focuses on UAS security efforts. Lisa co-founded the Domestic Drone Security Summit Series, bringing together national security agencies with industry to explore collaboration opportunities around drone security. 
Throughout her career, Lisa has worked to bridge government policymaking and business innovation. Lisa has held a variety of positions at top levels of the executive branch at the White House and the U.S. Department of Justice. Lisa led DOJ's effort to develop policy that would govern the use of UAS in the United States and participated in the federal interagency group tasked with integrating UAS into the national airspace system. Lisa's opinions are often featured in publications and news broadcasts such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Associated Press, Fortune Magazine, and others. Lisa was featured in Fortune Magazine's Most Powerful Women series for her efforts to develop policy to govern drone use in the United States. Lisa, we're so thrilled to speak to you today. So thank you for being on the show. There are a lot of interesting and perhaps a little controversial topics that we'll dig into. But before we go there, is there anything that very few in the industry agree with you on? Well, thank you for that question, Luca. And it is great to be here with you guys. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast. I'm thrilled to be here with you and your listeners. So let me start by saying that I think most in the industry would agree that There's so many exciting developments happening in this industry right now, and that the technology is moving quickly forward, and we're seeing so many incredible use cases that benefit the environment, that benefit safety, that benefit national security. We're seeing so many technological innovations emerge that have huge impact to our everyday way of life. And here in the US, towns and communities are really learning about this technology and getting excited about this technology. And we're seeing lots of programs spread up across the country. And we're also seeing it around the world. And we're seeing drones save lives and, um, you know, enhance safety and, and gain efficiencies in so many ways. I also think that we would all probably agree that the technology has moved more quickly than the policy, and that that's something that frustrates a lot of companies for good reason. It's created anxiety and uncertainty. There have been you know, some fits and starts. Obviously, the FAA, there are folks within the FAA that are working very, very, very hard to integrate UAS and AEM international airspace. But of course, there's also challenges. It's a timeless issue when you integrate any new technology into existing regulatory frameworks, there's always going to be challenges. So I don't know, but I, from my perspective, I think there's a lot of reason for optimism. And I don't know whether folks agree with me on that or not, but, you know, I'm looking at, recent activity that we're seeing across the federal government that uh, this is all moving forward. The White House AAM summit on August 3rd was a huge step forward. It shows renewed energy, focus and executive at the highest level, presidential leadership on this topic. The interest in maintaining and even enhancing America's global leadership in AAM, in advanced aviation, in small drones, large drones, eVTOLs, integration of AAM, all of the above. There's a lot of energy and focus on this topic administration-wide, which I think is fantastic. There are you know, lots of conversations happening around FAA reauthorization, which is next year. There's been, there's been a lot of moving around at the FAA. Folks that are paying close attention to the federal agencies will notice that we see some new folks and new roles. And I like to think, you know, from my perspective, this is seen as a moment of opportunity for all of us to educate policymakers and regulators and try to move this all forward. So um, I guess it's a question of whether folks agree with me, but I'm certainly enthusiastic and optimistic that we're really moving into, you know, the next generation of aviation. We need the policies to move forward. We need the regulations to move forward. And hopefully we're seeing some some new momentum here. Look forward to getting deeper into all of those things that you called out the summit and some of the ongoing regulatory decisions. Let's start with a high level view of the regulatory landscape for advanced air mobility. What are the key ongoing or upcoming discussions in the U.S. that are impacting drone operations? First, in terms of drone operations, obviously there's been a lot of Part 107 broadly enabled drone op- commercial drone operation across the U.S., but that was really just the first step. And there's been pilot programs and test sites doing great work and industry doing lots of research and development and drone operations happening at scale around the world. The real challenge here in the US and where we need to get sooner rather than later is scaled commercial drone operations here in the United States. So we saw an operations over people rule come out recently. There's a remote ID rule that's being implemented. That's a whole nother kind of separate area of conversation if you'd like to have it, but the remote ID rule will start to be implemented soon. And those are two kind of you know important steps forward, but they were, they were smaller steps forward. I think where we really need to get is beyond visual on a site, scaled commercial drone operations across the United States. 
there was an aviation rulemaking committee that was chartered by the FAA to bring industry together to talk about where this industry needs to go, where the FAA needs to go. We asked critical questions like, you know, you know, what are exactly the societal benefits, not just of drone operations, but what are the societal benefits of beyond visual on a site drone operations? What does the ability to fly beyond visual on a site add to all of the many societal benefits of drones and what's needed to get there? We asked, how is this industry funded? How is it designed? How is it different than crude aviation industry? And what does that mean for regulations that generally, you know, tend to reflect uh, the industry that it's regulating? And finally, what does the industry need, right? Both in terms of how, what is a rulemaking that will enable this industry to properly scale and bring these vast benefits to the American public, but also outside of the rulemaking? Are there other things that the industry needs in order to be able to scale? There were many discussions on this topic, lots of different stakeholders involved with those conversations. There was an excellent aviation rulemaking committee report that was delivered to the FAA, and the FAA is now analyzing that report and trying to figure out how, how to move forward. From a commercial drone alliance perspective, you know, we'd like to see the FAA implement that report as soon as possible. We understand that from a process perspective, there are certain kind of processes that, you know, obviously notice and comment rulemaking, all that kind of stuff that needs to be followed. And there could be reasons that you take a phased approach, which I think the FAA is leaning towards a phased approach for implementation you know, which can make sense and look forward to being a resource for the FAA and regulators and work closely in collaboration with the whole industry in order to see, you know, small drone and even larger drones able to be scaled here across the United States. And, and you were a part, obviously, of the BB Law SARG. What were the key takeaways? And more specifically also, what were the parts of the ARC recommendations that you most disagreed with or think that there should be a change? So, well, we actually, we did agree, you know, we, we agree with the ARC report. We think there's a lot of great recommendations in there. Essentially, the ARC report recommended a performance-based, risk-based framework that is an appropriate next step to broadly enable scaled drone operations. It's risk-based in that it kind of accounts for various environments, very, the various types of vehicles, that kind of thing, but it, and it's also performance-based and not prescriptive. So it doesn't require the use of any one detect and avoid technology, for example, or it essentially requires safety and works backwards. And of course, you can imagine there's lots of different conversations around what that looks like. We think it's the next, it's, it was a very well done, fantastic report. There's great content in there. From our perspective, and we wrote about this in that, you know, I think we we um, responded with comment, like we would have liked to even see more in there, like specific timelines for the FAA to follow, for example. But um, from a content perspective, we thought that the report was lays out a an appropriate and very well thought through and well thought out and well considered regulatory framework. And so, you know, substantively, we very much agree with the report. We just hope that it gets implemented as soon as possible. When do you expect the actual BB loss rulemaking from the FAA? And can you tell us a little bit more about this phased approach that you anticipate seeing? Sure. Well, let me first talk about, I'll, I'll talk about the rulemaking, but something that was in the ARC report that is, I think, that hasn't gotten as much attention is that there were many ideas that could actually be implemented without a rulemaking. There are lots of kind of short-term small steps that can be taken considering, for example, like standard scenarios, like process processes that the FAA could follow to provide certainty to the marketplace, to enable, um, for example, shielded operations that where, you know, drones that are flying where it doesn't make any sense for crude vehicles to fly because they may hit a power line, for example. There are definitely like lots of great ideas in there, which other countries have, some other countries have already implemented, such as standard scenarios, providing guidance to the industry. Like if you follow this type of con ops, you will be, you will likely be approved that could provide some certainty to the marketplace in a way that doesn't actually require rulemaking. So there are some short, you know, kind of short term steps within our report that don't actually need a rulemaking. And we would hope that the FAA would take a look at those and 
figure out kind of internally, like what are some small steps that we can take sooner rather than later that don't require the notice and comment rulemaking process. We all know that the notice and comment rulemaking process can take um, even years. I mean, I used to work at the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs at the White House. That is the most powerful agency in Washington, D.C. that nobody's ever heard of. Part of the what that office does is reviews rulemakings from agencies. But there's a whole, as part of that process, you know, there's the cost side, the benefit side. They have to consider and balance all of this when they're doing a rulemaking. It's a very thoughtful approach and for good reason. Because of that, there's many process requirements and and frankly opportunities for our industry to comment and be engaged on these rulemakings. But because of that, it just does take a longer time. So that's why it's important for the agency to consider and take advantage of any non-rulemaking approaches that are possible. So, but you asked specifically about the rulemaking. I mean, I'm just, you know, from what, what I've heard is that it would be a phased approach thinking about kind of what's possible in the short term. Are there tweaks to 107, for example, that would enable extended visual line of sight, that would enable certain types of beyond visual line of sight that are very low risk? And then, you know, the ARC report talked a lot about this new part 108, longer term, what would this new part 108 look like? From our perspective, a phased approach makes sense, but what we hope, we we wouldn't want to see a phased approach that you don't even start on phase two until you're totally done with phase one. This is all going to take time. So we want all of these phases to be considered and drafted in parallel and move forward just as soon as everything's ready, right? So there's no need to wait for phase one to end before phase two starts. What we want to avoid is a bunch of different processes that happen in parallel or in um, that are sequenced. Mm-hmm. So that there's five years passes before we even see a phase two. That that doesn't work from our perspective. So in other words, we might start seeing something as soon as end of this year or next year, yeah. and then working our way towards a, quote, full scope rulemaking in a couple of years, perhaps. Yes, exactly. Lisa, you're, you're a, as people heard in your bio, you're a foundational leader in the drone industry. And it's not very often you get a chance to hear from somebody with your background. In the in President Obama's uh, White House, you were the point person. I loved how you coined their term uh, polyvation, combining policy with innovation. What's happened over the last 12 years that has been significant advancements? And what were you thinking 10 years ago that you thought would happen, but really hasn't come together? And if you could, for some of our audience will be super sophisticated innovators and drones, and some will be, you know, just learning the the, uh, topic through our podcast. So if you could, if you could translate it for both audiences, that'd be great. Well, Jim, I appreciate that question. And thanks for watching the TED Talk. The the term polyvation came from, you know, I worked at the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. My focus over, you know, several years working in the administration was kind of focusing on emerging technologies, focusing on digital transformation of the federal government, of policymaking, and kind of thinking about how all of these things work together. And from my perspective, policymaking and innovation certainly just don't happen in a vacuum, right? And so you really need policymakers and innovators to be working hand in hand, working closely together. But regulatory authorities are every day, with, even without realizing it, kind of incentivizing certain behavior in the marketplace. There are ways to be incentivizing safety in our transportation system and vice versa. The industry is needs to be educating policymakers and regulators so that they understand the technologies that they've been tasked to regulate. So with that in mind, you know, I think um, looking back a decade and I've been working on this now for a decade, which is crazy uh, to think about. But when I first I still remember the first White House meeting and I was actually at DOJ at the time running the whole DOJ efforts on drones and in helping to lead and working hand in hand with the White House interagency team that was tasked with integrating drones into the national airspace. And I still remember at the first meeting that we had in a conference room at the White House, where we basically had you know a whiteboard and it was drones flying under helicopters, next to helicopters, under manned aircraft, crewed aircraft, um, over structures, uh, next to structures, over people, um, you know, and how does what does this mean? Like, how does this work? How does this actually function? And how can we actually integrate the the national airspace in a way that makes sense? And it's obviously a complex task, and we all know that it's a complex task. And I think what we can all agree on is that safety is first and foremost most important as a foundational principle. 
But I also do believe, I think if I thought 10 years, years ago, I would have hoped that we had made more progress than we had made now. The FAA Reauthorization Act of 2012 mandated that the federal government integrate drones into our national airspace. And we still don't have any rules that broadly enable this activity uh, in a way that enables industry to scale. So I definitely think that we are starting to fall behind the international community. And that's where we, it, and a lot, it has nothing to do with safety. A lot of the challenges that our industry faces are shared, first of all, across across aviation. I think we're, 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 we're all experiencing very similar process challenges. One of the hats that I wore when I worked at the White House was working with other countries on to be more open, more transparent, more collaborative, more in, you know, enhancing communications within their federal governments. And those are some of the same process challenges, frankly, that we have with our own government, right? In our own agencies here at home. Uh, how do we enhance transparency? How do we enhance accountability? You know, how do we make sure that staff level people aren't making policy decisions? How do we work to improve communication both within lines of business, among lines of business, and with relevant stakeholders? And so I think those are some challenges that the FAA struggles with generally, and certainly they're not alone among other agencies in the federal government. This is a timeless issue with big bureaucracies, but it's something that because the whole industry, you know, the whole aviation industry would share those challenges. The drone industry feels it most acutely because, you know, we're not able to be in business without these rule makings. We're not able to be in business without these approvals. Lisa, that was a, a really interesting comment you made about the process challenges and not really safety reasons for why we're seeing such a slow movement on the on the regulatory front on the FAA side. And I'm just amazed at the scale of that impact, honestly, because since, you know, roughly what, 2012, the Congress has directed the FAA on, on numerous occasions to accelerate the integration of, of drones and unmanned aircraft systems into the national airspace. And while, yes, there has been a lot of great progress, the industry still feels the FAA is moving too slow. And and it's really interesting to hear your perspective on the process and the lack of transparency and the difficulty in communication as one of the main reasons for it. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, and again, this is shared across aviation. And so, and it's a timeless challenge with the federal government. It's just like, we're feeling this more acutely. So I'll give you the type certification example or airworthiness certification example. That's a great example. Yeah. I mean, some companies entered that process, what, five years ago? Toby, and they were told it was about a six month process. And we're in 2022, and there's still no airworthiness certification that's been issued. The challenges of the companies going through the TC process or the airworthiness process are not, for the most part, not safety related. It's about different lines of business, providing different advice on what is the process that you should follow in order to get to operational approval with the TC aircraft. It's, it's going, you know, kind of going back and forth. It's the associated elements, which, you know, how should those be treated? It's all about like, what are the processes that we're following? Not how can we do this in a way that is safe? Like, industry yeah, so can you, can you go into a little bit more detail for the audience on the associated element certification challenge? How did it come up and how will it be solved? Absolutely. So this is this is an important one, um, including for companies that are considering going through the type certification process and haven't but, ha but haven't entered the process for whatever reason, and obviously for companies going through it now. So the easy way to think about this for for our listeners is, you know, an uncrewed aircraft system is made up of the drone and other equipment that is necessary to safely operate the operate the drone in the in the NAS in the national airspace system. So the equipment besides the drone, such as the communication links and the components that control the unmanned aircraft or uncrewed aircraft, that the launch and recovery mechanisms, the ground-based sensors, those kind of component, you know, whether they're hardware or software, those aspects to the drone system are the associated elements. And for the early movers that were trying to type, type certify their drones as a special class of aircraft using the FAA's durability and reliability or DNR process, which is the process that they have set up for small drones to go through this type certification process, everyone kind of initially assumed that the drone system as a whole would be type certified. What the FAA and some applicants discovered along the way was that under the current regulatory structure, type certifying the drone and its associated elements may create unintended problems post-certification, including issues related to continued airworthiness and configuration management. 
So I'll give one example that we can all just kind of understand about how this all came up. And I would, and then I'll talk both about the, you asked about process. This is a very important key part of why there has been some unhappiness here, you know, rather than the substance of, all, of this decision. So from a substance perspective, this challenge makes a whole lot of sense, right? So some drones going through the certification process may use an iPad for the control station. And if the iPad was part of the system being type certified, it would lead to some like ridiculous and absurd outcomes. So imagine, right, the, right of needing to take an iPad to an FAA certified repair facility to have right. an iOS update installed. A DO 254 and DO 178 certified iPad. Good luck. Yeah, right? Like it just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It leads to absurd results. You know, would you want that individual who installs the software need, need to, needs to be an FAA certified AMP mechanic, right? It doesn't make any sense. We can all understand that that just doesn't make sense. And everyone understands that that's unnecessary, but those are the types of scenarios that, that led the FAA to make this change and remove associated elements from the actual system that the FAA would be type certified. So rather than including associated elements as part of the type certificate, the associated elements would be taken out and then not reviewed, not approved by the FAA through the certification process, but through operational approvals. So, so approved by flight standards through operational approvals, like waivers, exemptions, or operating certificates that the you know, you as a company, if you're going through the process, you don't want to type certify a brick, right? You need to be able to fly it. You can't just get the type certification. You also need to be able to operate it. And so the idea was, okay, we'll have flight standards through that operational approval process approve the associated elements. But that, you know, last year, this was something that was raised. It was raised several years into the TC durability and reliability process. And there still remain open questions is how this process is going to work. And it's created lots of extra work for TC applicants. But in the end, I think we think it's like the right substantive result. It'll give manufacturers and operators more flexibility to make certain changes to associated elements as technology continues to evolve. However, there's just been process challenges in the short term for the companies that are currently going through this process because it's inserted a lot of uncertainty as to how all of this is going to resolve and end up in approvals from the agency. So from a practical perspective, how does an operator navigate this? What exactly does it mean to get an airworthiness certificate for the airframe? That's pretty straightforward and there's a process for it, but it seems like the operational approvals and the quote certification of the associated elements is still very much a an open issue at the moment. What will that certification operational approval look like in practice? I think at this point, there's been so many kind of iterations of this from the agency. I think at this point, folks are looking at in and, and the agency, by the way, is trying to convince all of the UAS industry to enter the type certification process because we want to enhance safety. From an industry perspective, there's skepticism. Is this a process that works? We haven't seen any approvals yet to date. I think at the end of the day, the question that you ask is the right one, which is when, you know, what's the bottom line here? What does this mean for our industry? And from our industry's perspective, we need to see an approval in order to incentivize the industry to want to even want to enter this process at all. Just to be clear, so if you get a type certified aircraft, there are conditions and limitations that will be included with the ability to operate. So you, it's not like all of a sudden you have a type certified aircraft and you're flying in downtown New York City. That's not how sure. this works. And I think getting an agency to also understand that they're not rubber stamping like the vehicle to fly everywhere and anywhere. I mean, that's not what this is about. This is about, you know, approving the vehicle in, in kind of streamlining the vehicle's ability to fly in the NAS under certain conditions and limitations. Safety is obviously paramount. It's not about safety. It's about how do we handle, um, you know, at a late date kind of considering, oh, how do we handle the noise aspect to this? How do we handle the environmental aspect to this? How do we handle, you know, and kind of thinking about bringing things in three, two, three years into the process that really should have been considered at the front end. So when do you expect the first type certified drones to appear in the U.S.? I hope this year. I hope in the next few months. In the next so that would be weeks. including the uh, that would include the associated elements approval. That would include the, well, I I don't know because I know that there are certain companies that are getting close to finishing this process, but I don't know exactly where they might be with operational approvals that kind of thing. So you know, as far as a type certification, I would expect us to see something soon. Of course, we've been saying that for a while now, so I'm not holding my breath. But I you know, fingers crossed, hope to see something soon. 
but that's kind of one piece of the puzzle, but it's not the only piece of the puzzle. Right, right. Even but, if you have that in your pocket, it doesn't mean that you can start operating, right? You still need that operational approval for the associated yeah. elements. So when I'm talking to folks in Europe, uh, operators and, and, and people in, at EASA, that doesn't come up as an issue for them. It seems like EASA is having a, a different perspective on associated elements without going into the weeds, but at a high level, do you have any thoughts on, on how they're looking at the associated element story? Well, so this is what I'll say. I, I think what I, from what I'm hearing, there is there has been some angst in the community because I, ideally we see harmonization globally, right? I mentioned in the ARC uh, report that there was talk about what does the industry need in order to be able to scale. If you're a company looking to operate around the world, what you'd like to see is international harmonization, at least particularly where it makes sense. I will say, you know, I get the question all the time, what are other countries doing to scale drone operations that we're not, right? Like what is the, why, why are some other countries ahead of the United States in drone integration? And I don't actually think it's a complicated answer. I mean, they, I think the answer is just that there's, that there are rules in other countries that are brought, that broadly enable drone use and that agencies follow them. Like the CAs follow them. There are rules, agencies follow them, and there is certainty for the marketplace. It's not necess- It's not like a rubber stamp. It's not like from a safety perspective that they don't have to make the safety case. They do make the safety case, but there are there is certainty in the marketplace because there are rules and there is a willingness to say yes. And so I don't think it's necessary. You know, so I think just kind of speaking globally, generally, I th- I don't think it's it's not rocket science for us to you know to to do this. We just have we just need rules and follow them. And and how much inspiration or perhaps influence do you think that the FAA is taking from some of these efforts internationally and, and specifically in the BB loss arc, the performance-based framework sounds very similar to the JARUS SORA framework. Is that the case? And, and, and if that's so, you know, how do you see the harmonization between the FAA and EASA on drone regulations in particular? Well, I do think the SORA is a great model for the FAA to follow, right? So for those who don't know, the specific, specific operations risk assessment enables countries to essentially have a set of rules that are and provide guidance to the industry about what might be appropriate and follow. And I talked about, you know, standard scenarios. That's kind of one way of doing that. So, so one of the challenges, let me just kind of break this down a little bit. One of the challenges for companies in the United States is that many approvals have been site specific and geographic specific, right? And so you go through this whole process with the FAA and then you're approved to fly at a set of coordinates one set of coordinates, maybe it's like a customer site or whatever it might be, but that's no way to scale drone operations. Under kind of a SORA approach would enable a qualitative assessment of what types of airspace am I able to fly in, what types, you know, what kind of population densities or what kind of communities, you know, rather than going off a site-by-site analysis, it, it allows kind of a broader look at an ability for industry to scale and by the way, for the FAA resourcing, because the FAA does not have the resources to review every single stoplight that every single drone in the country wants to be able to fly at. That just doesn't make sense for the agency or for industry. So there are other aviation authorities that have kind of come up with creative yet safety first and appropriate approaches that that make sense for the U.S. You know, to follow. Do you see a future where aircraft certified in the EU could fly in the U.S.? and vice versa through bilateral rules, harmonization? Um, yeah, I, I do. I don't think that's been set up yet, but that is certainly, I think generally, you know, in the manned aviation world, there are processes for recognition of other processes. So a lot of companies are dealing with this right now, right? Because they're like, do I get certified in the EU and then try to bring it to the US? Or do I get certified in the US and then try to take that to the EU? But I don't know that that's been figured out yet, but that's certainly top of the mind of industry. Lisa, I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the strategies that companies are adopting where they choose to accumulate flight experience internationally in some of these jurisdictions where the rules are more accommodating and then bring that flight mm-hmm. experience back into the U.S., We've also seen that with uh, military uncrewed systems that have accumulated a lot of flight experience in various parts of the world and now are coming back 
into the U.S. and want to get airworthiness certificate from the FAA so that they can fly in the NAS through controlled airspace in and out of the special use airspace, et cetera. What are some of the challenges associated with it and how much credit, quote, does the FAA give to that kind of experience? Sure. So, I mean, let me just, I think kind of speaking broadly, I think there are, let me start with the benefits. I think you asked the challenge, you asked for the challenges, but let me speak first to some of the benefits of doing that. There are obvious, there are challenges with just doing research and development here in the U.S., particularly with vehicles that are heavier than 55 pounds. Uh, unfortunately, this is an area where we, you know, we, so there are a bunch of pilot programs. If you're working through the BEYOND program, potentially you can get some expedited approvals. Um, the BEYOND program is the offshoot of the integration pilot program, of the FAA's pilot program. That's uh, states and localities are the lead participants and work with industry. And I think that the, and those programs are, are helpful, but there have been, and the test sites are doing great work. But there have been many challenges with doing research and development in the United States. And I know that because many of my clients are experiencing that. Unfortunately, there's been a recently kind of a very, from our perspective, overly restricted view of or legal interpretation of public aircraft operations and things that test sites have been able to do for many years. They're no longer able to do with that data being able to be used for anything kind of um, for re, you know research and development purposes in a way that you could use the data towards like, let's say a type certification approval later on. There have been same thing with public agencies, same thing with public universities. Anytime you, if you even wanna fly a drone that's heavier than 55 pounds, that's an exemption process, which is a rulemaking process, which, which just takes a long time. So for that reason, I think you see many companies saying, well, how do I do research and development? Let me try to figure this out. Let me just start by saying, I think we need to enhance the ability for industry to do research and development in the United States in order to maintain our global leadership. I think that's a critical national security issue. So that's something that I just wanna get out there first, that there shouldn't we shouldn't need to rely on the ability to fly internationally or partner with DOD in order to get flight time in the US, right? Like we need to be able to provide um, hubs of innovation here in the US and uh, enable research and development here in the United States. So let me start there. That said, we don't currently have that broad enabling environment for research and development. And so because of that, many companies need to go international or need to partner with DOD in order to get flight time. I think it's a great way to get flight time. I think it's a great way to get experience. I think it's a great way to get experience where it, like, let's just talk internationally. If you're going to be flying internationally, it's a great way to get real world experience internationally, work with other communities, work with other CAAs you know, figure out what works. I think that that is a positive. Certainly that data is valuable, but I think that the FAA considers the national airspace in the U.S. to be particularly complex and require kind of its own safety analysis. And so it's not like you're going to be able to say, well, I'm flying in so-and-so country, so therefore you have to approve me here and they're going to rubber stamp that. That's not how it works. Right. So what's your advice to entrepreneurs who are pursuing this strategy? I, I actually understand the strategy right now, but I would just be realistic and clear-eyed about the benefits. So it will enable you to do research and development in a way that is helpful, but it's not its not going to be the be-all, end-all. Just because you do this internationally is not necessarily going to result in a quick approval here in the U.S. I would advise entrepreneurs that have the resources to be in both countries to be in both countries because if you build your relationship with the FAA here at home, that helps over time to establish credibility with the agency. One challenge that I think a lot of companies have is that they go work abroad and only work abroad and then come here to the FAA and say, okay, we're, we've done this abroad, so we're ready to do this here. And they, the FAA doesn't know who they are. It, there's no track record of working with the agency. There's no track record of necessarily working with partners here in the US. You wanna have an established track record in order, if you're looking to do advanced approvals and advanced operations, it's a good idea for you also to kind of have track record here at home. Lisa, let's talk a little bit about uh, just event air mobility in general and the overall ecosystem. What most excites you? Drones, eVTOL, regional air mobility? Well, that's like asking me to choose among my children. <laughs> like, I'm excited about all of it. I think that there's huge value to all of it, right? I mean, and from my perspective, they're all intertwined. You know, we're all kind of coming at this from a, what, like there's an aviation revolution that's happening. There's so many great ideas across across the aviation industry 
it's a really exciting time. We're getting new new talent into the aviation pipeline. There's new excitement around all of these technologies. So I'm excited about all of it. I'm clear-eyed in that, you know, UAS are here today. They're adding value today. The FAA is really prioritizing UAS integration for that reason, right? But I think it's also critical to uh, move the broader advanced air mobility industry collectively forward. And, you know, I, it's, it's interesting because some people say, oh, UAS and, A, and UAM are so different or regional air mobility, you know, so different. But I actually think about them as kind of siblings. Like there are a lot of issues that are that the industries have in common. Unmanned traffic management, automation, remote identification, uh, challenges of, of integration more generally, right? So there's a lot of kind of complementary policy issues that are shared across these industries. And then of course, there are some differences as well. But I think that uh, there's a lot that the eVTOL space can look to the small UAS space of, okay, you went through this a few years ago. How did you handle this, right? Like, are the process challenges that we're talking about? How did you handle the process? How are you, you know, like, what should we be thinking about, right? And I, I would just share a few ideas there of like security issues, right? The drone industry was kind of slow to recognize that security issues were going to be so paramount in drone integration, not because they were thinking about things in a way that was insecure, but because the federal government needs legal authority in order to counter UAS or mitigate rogue drones flying in the airspace. So that kind of set the drone industry back several years. There was a remote identification rule. There were counter drone authorities with the Preventing Emerging Threats Act that needed to be passed. So it kind of put advanced UAS operations on hold for several years while the federal government kind of thought through all those issues. So, you know, the AAM industry should be thinking similarly. What are, the, are there potential security issues we need to get ahead of? The national security agencies have equities here. Like we should be, you know, we need to be working with them early on. So we make sure that we're not delayed later. And we make sure that all of the relevant agencies are at the table. That's just one example, right? What the, what the UAS industry is going for right now, going through right now in terms of environmental approvals, like that's something else that the AAM industry will later on also likely experience. So um, I think that there's a lot of lessons learned. I think that there's a lot that we share in this broader uh, advanced aviation ecosystem. And I think that we have a lot more in common than differences. And I think that we all need to collaborate to move this forward. Are there any remaining privacy concerns and regulation around that topic? Uh, and in particular, the air rights. Is that a topic that you think will be debated as drone deliveries increase in scale? Well, let me start by saying, so I, I actually, there, you know, the pri privacy issues have been debated and discussed for for many years now. I think that there were, it was a bigger issue when drones were kind of first introduced to the American public. I still remember there was um, the modern family. It was, it was everywhere in popular culture. Is a drone spying on me in my backyard and my neighbor, you know, like there was the modern family episode where the dad kind of tried to shoot the drone out of the sky and um, <laughs> ended up with his pants down. So, you know, it was like, there were, there was just all these popular culture references. I think we see less of them now. I was actually speaking of popular culture, right? Like there's just more of an, a public acceptance of this technology. I was watching, I have a two-year-old daughter and there was um, a Paw Patrol like cartoon on um, the other day and they had in this cartoon there were drones being used for search and rescue <laughs> like right so it's like at the at, at, at our youngest uh, like our youngest children are growing up to see drones saving people's lives and and doing good so I think like some of those privacy concerns came from some like a lack of education of what drones were being used for I do think some of that is quelled I think you, you know, there are many privacy laws and rules that are already on the books. Like just privacy is generally regulated under state law. There are trespass laws, intrusion upon seclusion, misappropriation of trade secrets. If there are like privacy issues, there are likely already regulatory or legal remedies for them. A drone is just a platform for a camera or some other sensor. And just like our cell phones, just like helicopters. So there are not all that many relevant differences. And so, you know, from our perspective, we promote and support technology neutral laws and rules that uh, apply to privacy. We absolutely agree that privacy is paramount, but it's just a matter, it's just, you know, we don't think that drones are necessarily special in that, in that way. I participated in the National Telecommunications Information Administration, NTIA, multi-stakeholder process several years ago, which crafted some privacy best practices for the UAS industry. 
I would encourage folks in the industry to look those best practices up. I certainly recognize the concern, but I think that there are many laws and rules that would already apply to to that activity. Got it. And what, Lisa, what about trespassing? Is that has that argument been put to bed? Before commercial aviation, it was considered that private airspace ownership extends really to infinity above a property. And then the concept of navigable airspace above 500 feet was defined. Is there now today crystal clear understanding of the rights that individuals have in the immediate reaches of their property? Well, it's a great question. Um, Luca, and it's frankly, we could have several hours of discussion on this one topic. There's been some court cases. I don't know if you're con- familiar with the Kentucky, Kentucky Drone Slayer case that was on this particular subject. It was dismissed on jurisdictional grounds, so it didn't get into the substance, but it was, you know, basically a guy shot his neighbor's drone out of the sky and there was a trespass claim and there was a dispute that didn't end up getting um, decided on the merits. What you're asking is, I mean, there's the Cosby case, World War II era or so, that is a different context, but was considering military aircraft that were flying low over a farmer's lawn and killing chickens flying so low over the ground. And the Supreme Court in that case said, well, I forget exactly what it was, 80 or so feet above the ground is your immediate reaches of your land, which from a taking, this is a takings case, so not really trespass, but from a government takings perspective, you should be able to control the immediate reaches of your land, but that was, you know, pretty limited. So I think it's a great question. I think there's a lot of attention. It's a it's a hot topic these days, and we'll have to see what kind of clarification we get. From our perspective, it's very important that the FAA is able to regulate from the blade of grass to the sky because regulate safety, because what we want to avoid is a patchwork quilt of regulations. We've talked about international harmonization. We also want to avoid a situation where there's a patchwork quilt of different aviation regulations in each state or city or town or community such that it's impossible to you know, operate in more than one place. And do you think that this discussion might limit how cargo drone deliveries scale? I think if we see lots of state legislation pop up on the topic, then it absolutely could impact how these technologies scale. I will note that in the Aviation Rulemaking Committee report on industry needs, there was a section on that which talked about kind of clarification or certainty on these topics is a necessary aspect to industry scaling. Lisa, recently there was a White House uh, AAM summit. Let's say President Biden called you and said, you know, give me the highlights of the summit and what are a couple of things that I should do as a result of what you heard from the summit, what would you tell them? I think the summit was a fantastic opportunity to bring a wide group of stakeholders together to promote and encourage continued American leadership in advanced aviation globally. And I think the, so there were a, there was a bunch of really great speakers from NASA, from FAA, from industry, from of course the White House, both the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the National Economic Council, the National Security Council. There was broad agreement that it's an economic and security imperative to maintain and promote global leadership in these advancement of these technologies. So I think everyone kind of looks at that White House summit and thinks, okay, that was an amazing first step. Great to show federal leadership on this topic. The White House uniquely has the ability to bring federal agencies together, to bring the federal government together, bring all relevant state, you know, states, localities, tribes together with industry in order to talk about how to best solve some of these very real challenges. And from here, we hope to see, you know, an executive action that actually puts tangibly some of these ideas into into a presidential directive or an executive order or a presidential memorandum, kind of outlining a national vision or a national strategy for the future of American and prioritizing American global leadership in advancement of these aviation technologies. And that would be the first national vision or national strategy on the topic. I think it would be, it promotes you know, many of this administration's broader policy priorities, including sustainability, creating jobs, promoting growth of the economy, promoting national security, advancing equity, democratizing aviation, opening the aviation industry up to new stakeholders. And that's in addition to enhancing safety and promoting public health benefits, including for rural communities who could, you know, get access to 
to new goods and services, including medical supplies. So there's, I think, a lot of opportunity here. We're working with kind of a broader, you know, the Commercial Drone Alliance is working with many other relevant stakeholders on this and what something like that might look like so we can kind of present it to the White House. But it's um, certainly an exciting time. I think there's a lot of opportunity. And now we're just looking for some tangible steps forward here that I think could could really benefit this industry and the American public more broadly. Let's say there was an entrepreneur. I'm going to step on one of our last questions, but let's say an entrepreneur was in the back of the audience and, and heard everything that was being discussed. What would she or he come away with and think, oh, here's something that is a problem that has to be solved that perhaps people aren't focused on right now that I should put some time behind, put some money behind. I would say if you're an entrepreneur, there it's certainly drone security issues are certainly top of mind for the US government. From a White House perspective, they've come out with this national action plan on counter drone initiatives and on drone security. And they're now working closely with Congress to get some legislation passed that will more broadly enable detection technology, as well as create counter drone pilot programs across the country uh, for mm -hmm. states and localities who are interested in utilizing this technology. So there's certainly a, a, a lot of energy behind some of those initiatives. And then there was also a lot of talk of some of the kind of commerce and commercial and security aspects to UAS and AM integration. So there's, I think, a lot of opportunity there. Um, but I, I don't know that I would say any one issue. The, the goal mm -hmm. of the summit was certainly not to focus on any one initiative or technology. The mm -hmm. goal of the summit was to, to express the need and desire and to how do we promote the use of these technologies in a way that is safe and secure. You know, we're certainly not looking mm -hmm. to do anything that is reckless. This is about moving forward in a collaborative and thoughtful way to integrate these technologies here in the US so that companies don't feel like they need to go abroad in order to do their testing, research and development, development and also scaling their drone operations. Before we started the recording, we talked briefly on, on remote ID. Can you catch us up on, on the latest on that front? So it's a great question. Obviously, the remote ID rule went into effect and required implementation of the remote ID rule for manufacturers coming up here in September in just a few weeks. Um, there are some challenges with that date because it's only recently that the FAA has approved the uh, means of compliance for how to how industry can comply with remote identification. So there's been some anxiety in the industry about implementation date, whether it might be extended. It's very it's a, it's a very quick turnaround to be asked as a manufacturer to be implementing every every drone you produce is going to have this remote ID technology integrated, you know, within a few weeks if they only if the industry only just learned how the FAA would accept such implementation. So there are conversations ongoing. We have not, you know, there's no formal response from the FAA at this point about whether an extension might be uh, helpful. I do know, but when, when we think about from a UAS operator perspective and a UAS ecosystem perspective, the big deadline really is next year. Next year, around this time, all operators will be required to have remote identification integrated into their system. And at that point, I think the FAA would really start enforcing the rule. I don't expect that that deadline would be extended. That deadline would still exist. So everyone in the, in the industry should know that remote ID is here. You should read the rule. You should figure out how you're going to try to follow it and plan for it. But in the short term, if you are a manufacturer, there might be some wiggle room in the, with an extension date, but we just don't know yet. Lisa, if you fast forward five years and then also 10 years out, what does the drone industry look like? So I think in five years, we have a very active drone ecosystem where we have integrated, scaled drone operations inspecting infrastructure across the country, spraying crops, delivering packages. And I would say small drones and larger drones are just much more integrated than they are today uh, at a broad, a broad scale. Longer term, we're going to see integration, you know, full integration, including of eVTOLs, passenger carrying vehicles into, you know, in the short term, they'll be piloted in the longer term automated, although there are some companies that are trying to do automated from the start. But, um, you know, certainly, there is amazing techno technological innovation happening now. And I very much, you know, I, I very much hope that innovators and policymakers can really work together to to move forward 
expeditiously but thoughtfully in a way to integrate these technologies here in the United States, because I do think it's, it's imperative for the United States in order to maintain our global leadership we need to figure this out. It's not an easy task. That's why it's taken so long. But we have very brilliant people working on this. And I have a lot of faith that it can get done in a way that is safe, secure, respective of privacy, you know, and in a way that we're able to really benefit the American people collectively. So what advice would you give to someone who wants to start a business in advanced air mobility? And it's I know I'm saying the broader advanced air mobility, but whether it be a drone or an eVTOL or something in regional air mobility, what would be three things you'd give to them? So a few different things. But first, I think, and most important, you should know that you're entering a regulated marketplace. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think about drones as kind of fancy toys. And no, we're talking about aviation and you will be regulated by the FAA. The national airspace is regulated by the FAA. So understand that there is, it is a highly regulated marketplace and be ready for that and kind of invest in that part of your program. The second thing and probably related thing is that it is a regulated marketplace where there is still a lot of uncertainty as to how it is regulated. So make sure that you have funders who understand that there is mm. uncertainty around the regulation it's not a, it's not like you're in an industry which has been settled for many years and there's like a path and you know exactly how you're going to comply that's not where this is that also allows for vast opportunity that would come to my third point recognizing that it's highly regulated that there is uncertainty that also provides a huge amount of opportunity for new entrepreneurs and innovators who are willing to work closely with the federal government to figure this out. You know, certainly there's a reason that there are companies that are really excited about being kind of, you know, one of the first when it comes to type certification, because you're paving the way for an aviation revolution. You're paving the way for these advanced technologies to really take off here in the United States. And that is no small thing. And that is incredibly, incredibly important and an honor and in a very important role for your company. So I all that's to say is that it's a very special time in aviation. It's a very special time for our industry. And I think there's a ton of opportunity in this industry for folks who kind of have the see the long game here, recognize that you need to somewhat be patient working with lots of working with the federal government, but that there is a huge reward in the end for all of us. Is there anything that you would single out as the most common misconception or misunderstanding? I mean, the, the most common misconception that I hear is simply that it's not very regulated or that it's in, in or, or underestimating what it will take to comply with regulations and, and to understand the kind of nature of the regulations and how to get expanded operation approvals, that kind of thing. So I think where a lot of companies just underestimate their, the fact that they, you know you should have a DC presence, you should be involved with the industry, you should be involved with industry groups that are seeking to promote these, um, you know, seeking to collaborate with the federal government about how to move all this forward. There's a great opportunity there, but it's also kind of a necessity. I don't envy you answering this question, but if you were going to summarize <laughs> the podcast for in a minute or so, or... What would be one le message you want to give to our listeners that uh, you feel is most important for them to hear? It's a great question. I mean, there's reason for optimism. There is, it's a great industry. You guys are all doing amazing work. Stick with it. Be patient. I know it's frustrating sometimes. I feel your pain. It's, um, you know, I absolutely understand that that technology can move a lot more quickly than than policy but it's also really impor important that we get the policy right we have seen a lot of really sol you know exciting signs from the federal government like the white house summit so there's there is reason to to believe we can collectively work together to move this all forward um you know the challenges that we're sharing are shared across aviation this is um in our shared, frankly, across industry, working with federal government. I mean, it's just, that's like the nature of federal government just moves slow. They don't move at the, at the speed of Silicon Valley. So understanding that going in and being willing to kind of work side by side with regulators will go a really long way. And I think it's important for all of us. So you know, I appreciate you having me on this podcast. If you're not familiar with the Commercial Drone Alliance, you know, we'd, we'd love to work with you. If you're in the industry, reach out to us, www.commercialdronealliance.org. You know, we're really focused on enabling and expanding the commercial and really broader advanced aviation marketplace, you know, and would love to work with, with you and um, others on, on this to move this all forward for the benefit of the American people. Thanks so much, Lisa, for sharing your thoughts. And uh, thank you for being our guest. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it, Jim and Luca.
All right, that's a wrap for today. Thank you for listening to the Vertical Space Podcast. Reach out if there are topics that you would like us to discuss and goodbye until the next episode. Unless mentioned, this podcast is in no way endorsing or promoting any person and or company mentioned and all opinions within the podcast are solely that of the presenters. The Vertical Space makes no guarantees, warranty or representation of any information given in this podcast. Any information given is for informational purposes and should be used at your own risk. This podcast is for general, educational, and entertainment purposes only.